Hi, welcome to the official podcast of the WCD. That's the World Congress of Dermatology, which will be held next in Singapore in 2023. I am Dr. Etienne Wang from the National Skin Center of Singapore, and I will be a host for this podcast. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. In this podcast, I speak with dermatologists and skin researchers from all over the world to talk about all things dermatology. And today, my resident co-host, Shashin, is back for another derm topic for discussion. Hi, Shashin. What's up today? Hi, Dr. Etienne. So glad to be back. Well, for today, I thought we'd talk about um, diversity in dermatological education, specifically looking at skin of color. Wow, that's very interesting. Yes, I think what actually uh, got me thinking about this topic was, um, as a resident in, in a tertiary hospital, we see patients in of many different skin phototypes. Given that Singapore has a wide variety of different races, it's a multi-ethnic uh, society. I realized that when I was looking at an Indian patient with eczema, that I almost started to type erythematous scaly plaques. And, you know, it's almost like a reflex, but this patient presented nowhere like the usual eczema patient. And then it, I sort of realized, I did some reading online as well, that skin of color is very infrequently represented in a lot of the derm textbooks or even the medical school textbooks. Uh, when we started our residency, one of the first things we were told to do was to read um, the Asian Skin Atlas. And I think that was eye-opening because when I read that, I realized that a lot of conditions do present differently in different skin types. Um, a lot of the textbooks I had read in medical school showed these rashes, which would typically look red or pink on white skin, whereas um, in the context that we practice, it may look different even on, for example, the skin of a Chinese patient versus an Indian patient. Uh, something that's inflamed may not necessarily look red. It could look more hyperpigmented or black or purplish violaceous. Um, so I thought it would be an interesting topic to look at. That's quite an important thing nowadays, especially when we're looking at equity in both patients and trainees. What, what do you think is a bigger problem that is pervasive in dermatology textbooks? Right. So I think uh, on one end, you have the source, which is the textbook. And a lot of these from the start did come from the West, so America, Europe. On the other end, we have the patient, who is ultimately the reason we're, we're doing all of this, to benefit the patient. So I think going back to the source, it's basically a question of representation in the literature, in the textbooks. Mm -hmm. For example, if we're doing a slide presentation on condition A, we're most likely to use a picture that we find either on Google or a textbook, which would feature Caucasian skin, white skin. And that tri trickles down to all sorts of medical education, gets used in presentations, research, uh, maybe even lit reviews. Whereas it's only if you even count the number of uh, pigmented skin that's featured in these textbooks, it's very, very little. It may be perhaps for certain conditions only. Um, so I think the primary problem is a question of representation of diversity in um, textbooks and education materials. Yes, I totally agree. Not only that, but there is also an over-representation of skin of colour in some other parts of dermatology, such as venereology, where you have STIs over-representing black and brown patients. And not only that, when the first pictures of HIV came out, all the opportunistic infections, these were pictures of LGBT people which were heavily over-represented in these kinds of pictures. And this can actually perpetuate negative stereotypes of patients in the doctor's eyes, don't you agree? Absolutely. I was just reading an article in the New York Times where a dermatologist in the US mentioned that when pictures of black patients were available, you know, online, for example, they most often described syphilis. And it even even as for a medical student reading that, I agree, it subconsciously it does create this sort of stereotype and reinforce that when the only time you see a black person, for example, is in a textbook describing syphilis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you think we can improve this for our patients? For us, we are at an advantage because we do see a lot of, there's a high traffic of these patients with varied different skin phototypes, different skin colors. And we have our own textbook. Absolutely. The Asian Skin Atlas. Yeah, we can plug that. <laughs> yes, definitely. So I think starting small on the level of, you know, within our centers, uh, our tertiary hospitals, within our clinics, within our residency training programs to identify conditions that may present differently in skin of color. And I think also to keep in mind that these patients have different needs. For example, hyperpigmentation may be much more of a problem in, for example, Indian skin 
compared to a different skin type. Even something like vitiligo might be more troublesome for a patient of a certain skin color. So I think it starts at the level of one's own training program or one's own center, uh, and then trickles all the way upwards, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yep, not only that, but we're also hearing recently that eczema behaves differently in Western populations and Asian populations. So that there's a space to keep your eye on too. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you, Shashin. That was very, very um, exciting and very, very educational as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Glad to be back here. Okay, okay. Bye-bye. All right, bye. <laughs> And now, welcome to the podcast, Professor Tae Hong Liang. Professor Tae is a senior consultant at the National Skin Center and he heads our research department as well as the Itch or Neurodermatitis Clinic. He's also a prolific clinician scientist who was awarded the National Healthcare Group Outstanding Citizenship Award for his work on hypohydrosis and has been pivotal in the development of a very popular local moisturizer that contains menthol, Su Balm. Most recently, the research department at NSC was successful in obtaining the generous NMRC Center grant and Prof Tae was central in this achievement. Congratulations, Hong Liang, on this impressive resume. Thank you very much, Ethan. <laughs> can you please tell us more about this center grant and what we can expect from NSC in the next five years? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. What are we going to achieve? What are we looking forward to? And like, say, five years later, ten years later, I think a very important part is actually how can we better equip our clinical facilities through research to meet the challenges that we are facing right now and as you know, we have this rapidly aging population, which is also coupled with rapidly rising healthcare costs. And so this really provide a chronic strain on the healthcare system. And sometimes you need an acute environment like the, this COVID outbreak actually to tip the tip the system over. And just recently, I some doctors in hospital, public hospital commented that the Singapore healthcare system looks like it's going to collapse because under this heavy strain. So I think for us in research, we really have to provide ways and means to how to actually enable our clinical uh, system to function better, to cope with future, current and future challenges. Mm. Can you give us an example of how our research is going to improve this? Mm, sure. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of ways that we, we are approaching uh, uh, this goal in terms of uh, over improving the healthcare system. So the first part is actually uh, improvement in individual healthcare outcomes. You know, uh, we should do research innovation and enterprise to able to translate research, not just from bench to bedside, but also to the bedroom even uh, in, in terms of population health. Uh, also, so I think besides the usual way in which we do research innovation um, enterprise, we should also uh, embark on innovative research to actually find alternative new ways to actually address the existing problems rather than just using the conventional ways and means in which a problem still exists. We should try uh, using uh, newer technology, newer methods, newer approaches to actually address the existing problems. So this is what I would call uh, innovative research. And then after that, we want to translate it and we want to implement it and expand it as far as possible, uh, even commercialize it so that more people can use. Yeah, so that's the first part uh, in terms of improving healthcare outcomes. The second part is preventive healthcare. Uh, in which we want to actually prevent the disease and treat the mild diseases at the population level. And so this is to reduce the overall healthcare burden. We want to put the healthcare, low-cost healthcare into people's hands. And for this, we also need to drive technological change uh, to put all these low-cost technologies into people's hands and low-cost treatment into people's hands. Mm. Uh, finally, yeah, yeah. so I think uh, beyond, beyond all this, we must be able to effectively implement all this. And I think uh, NSC as a, a national centre has this, uh, val this unique uh, position to, able, to be able to implement all these into the, for the whole country because uh, Singapore is small, means NSC is located in the centre of the country. And so it just sort of positions us to be uh, and able to reach out to all the people in Singapore and we can very fast implement all these. And, and, but I think beyond our shores, we should also try to commercialize uh, all these benefits, not just commercialization, teledermatology, we can reach out to further, uh, reach out further beyond our shores to other populations in other parts of the world. And you have a special interest in itch. Is there any itch-related condition that you think will benefit most from this approach? 
Yeah, so I think everybody itches. Uh, so uh, the prob- So we have actually um, tried to improve the management of, of itch uh, by stra- firstly stratifying the condition into mild, moderate, severe. And we want to treat the mild conditions using the over-the-counter products. Patients don't even have to see a doctor. They can just treat themselves, prevent diseases, and keep the diseases down. Um, so for the uh, moderate ones, uh, I think uh, we want patients to be able to use, to have access to treatment that is uh, easily available, uh, even uh, just available through retail pharmacies when they can just talk to the pharmacist to get the medication. We provide uh, good uh, gu- guidelines and also instructions of how to make use of these safe medications. And then uh, for those severe ones, um, then we want to actually come up with a better understanding of the pathogenesis and better treatments so that enable to doctors uh, to actually institute the treatment for these severe cases. And so we have actually uh, done that and we are actually further trying to improve our uh, clinical guidelines and uh, implementations. Hmm. I recently sat in with an itch clinic of yours and I was quite surprised when you suggested that I treat a patient with chronic idiopathic itch with isotretinoin. Is that something that is commonly done these days? Yeah, so uh, I just presented this at the World Congress of Itch just two days ago and um, so so I think uh, uh, my pitch is that uh, Everything that we are trying to do now is uh, to control the condition by using immune modulatory agents. Uh, but patients always ask, so uh, am I going to use this for the rest of my life? Uh, it's just controlling my symptoms, right? And then once I stop and then it comes back again and it's so expensive, how long am I going to sustain this for? So I think uh, very much uh, what patients want is that we can actually address the underlying cause. And that's what we are actually uh, doing, trying to uh, structure, uh, address the un- underlying structural abnormalities and uh, trying to provide a longer lasting uh, resolution for patients. And, and that is not to say that we don't provide symptomatic treatment, but I say both these uh, will go hand in hand to amend the structure of the epidermis through systemic retinoids, but at the same time also controlling inflammation with immune moderatory drugs. And I think uh, this will greatly improve the uh, clinical outcomes of patients in whom currently there's hardly any good treatment. Mm, that's, that's very exciting. I'm really interested to see how these patients turn out. What other research areas are you interested in? Yeah, so uh, besides uh, itch, right, uh, uh, my interest is, uh, the other interest is in the sweat disorder. So uh, this covers uh, under the umbrella of neurodermatology, people who sweat too much, too little. Um, so uh, so far, uh, previously, I've been t- embarked on t- uh, focusing on the hypohydrosis in which patients cannot sweat and they get heat uh, stroke and they can even die from it, in which we have a number of fatalities in s- Singapore even. Yeah, so I think that one, we actually uh, sort of uh, resolved the issue by identifying that the various subtypes of hypohydrosis actually uh, involve the superficial, very superficial, complete blockage uh, of the sweat orifices and by, again, using systemic retinoids uh, at, at a higher dose uh, dosages, uh, we can actually help uh, uh, resolve the condition permanently. And so far, over these few years, by and large, uh, almost all the patients uh, do not have recurrences. But uh, nevertheless, I think we still have to try to understand better what initiated the condition in the first place to ultimately uh, prevent the condition from coming back, especially if we believe that the environment causes are the ones that first initiated the problem. All very interesting stuff. I think we're all very excited to see what new advances and new things you're going to bring to the center, Hong Liang. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Ethan, for the interview. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. All right. And that was the official podcast of the WCD. Don't forget to follow us on all our socials on Facebook, Instagram at WCD2023 Singapore, and check out our WCD website, WCD2023Singapore.org for more updates and content on the WCD. And until next time, stay safe and use sunblock.